This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Dr. Milton Cudney, a counseling psychologist at Western Michigan University, has found that the proverb, you are your own worst enemy, is usually profoundly true, and that such habits as constant worrying and putting off decisions are self-generated and self-defeating, and that only you yourself can conquer them. Dr. Cudney advises, take each trait one at a time. Don't try to change yourself entirely overnight. It's much easier to eliminate self-defeating attributes by starting with small, manageable pieces. The inventor Thomas Edison said that one of his own psychological secrets of effective accomplishment was that he had trained himself always to do the hardest tasks first. Each day when he arose, he turned his attention initially to the most arduous undertakings. He termed leaving the hardest tasks until last, quote, fatal. But above all, bear ever in mind that there is tremendous, untapped, spiritual power available for the daily work of your daily living, and that the infinite love of the infinite God for you as an individual can amazingly transform human life, if you will but claim it by living faith. I asked an old banker one time what the secret of success was. He said, it isn't any secret. What you have to do is jump when your opportunity comes. I said, how can you tell when your opportunity comes? He said, you can't. You just have to keep jumping. But that caliber of energetic alertness requires a dynamic inner psychological and spiritual life. If you honestly live in love for God and love for others, in touch with the spirit within, seeking the will and wisdom of God, questing perfection, and living by the highest of values and purposes, your life for now and for all eternity will be an indescribably joyous adventure of satisfying growth and genuine accomplishment. The British philosopher A.E. Orridge has written, Remember, you are a pianist, not a piano. Act. Do not merely be acted upon. Professor Dewey wrote, Only the cornered rat will think. Human beings, however, possess the faculty, if they will employ it, of thinking instead of being cornered. But really deep thinking is extraordinarily rare. It is written in the Catechism of the Maccabean Scholars. Do more than exist. Live. Do more than look, observe. Do more than read, absorb. Do more than hear, listen. Do more than listen, understand. Do more than think, ponder. And do more than plan, act. This caliber of careful thinking enables the individual not merely to see things from his own perspective, but to envision the other sides of a question and thereby to avoid the philosophic error of oversimplification. Optic scientists have found that the human eye is capable of distinguishing between some two million different shades of color. The human mind is likewise capable of perceiving a vast variety of aspects to any question or problem. And the best thinkers are those who utilize the full potentials of the mind when considering a problem. The best creative thinkers are not those who restrict themselves to three or four standard solutions to problems but who will dare to imagine innovative approaches which rely upon the human mind's ability to conjecture a wide variety of possibilities. This is a marvelously interesting world, and the most psychologically healthy individual is the one who is able to find it all marvelously interesting. For a diversity of interests is essential to balance. Dr. Lawrence S. Kuby, the psychiatrist, has described neurotic behavior as, quote, resistant, to development and growth that is rigid, inflexible, and afraid of change. Psychologically healthy behavior, by contrast, says Dr. Kuby, is flexible, growing, and eagerly learning new wisdom and understanding. It is this need for the stimulus of diversity which Ellsworth Huntington portrayed when he wrote, Man thrives best in places and under conditions where he has to face the most opposite extremes of many kinds, weather, temperature, difficulties, competition, races, religions, and points of view. What has psychology found are the most important ingredients in the living of a happy life? Scientists at the Harvard Research Center, working under Dr. Petirim A. Sorokin, tested thousands of people and concluded that the single most essential prerequisite for human happiness is love. These Harvard researchers reported that self-centeredness and unhappiness go hand in hand, and that love is the best cure for despondency. It was found that for children in elementary school, happiness was usually defined in terms of wish fulfillment, a new bicycle, a doll, trip to the circus, etc. 
But that as men and women became more mature, they began to equate happiness increasingly with personal satisfaction, love, fulfillment. In other words, with more spiritual qualities. Correlatively, it was found that, quote, unhappiness was approximately five times higher among non-religious people than among those who described themselves as, quote, very religious. Two other university studies showed that, quote, happy persons place the greatest importance on such things as peace of mind, clear conscience, friendship and affection, love of one's work, enjoyment of nature. Less happy individuals seek happiness in thrills, excitement, acquiring money, travel, new clothes, new cars, and entertainment. End of quote. Dr. James McDermott, clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington, says his studies indicate that the principle it is more blessed to give than to receive is literally true. I quote him, free-hearted, generous giving is a prescription I'd recommend for any man or woman who'd like to live a healthier, happier life. He says people whose greatest interest is in getting tend to use most of their energies in acquiring, which creates what the professor calls a demanding attitude, which often triggers a negative response from those around you. When you focus on receiving, you're often turned down and often disappointed. But when you're giving to somebody, you're thinking of them instead of yourself. It's almost always healthier to concentrate on the people around you than to adopt a self-centered attitude that results when you're only thinking of getting for yourself, end of quote. And psychiatrist Dr. Carl Menninger wrote, love cures people, both the ones who give it and the ones who receive it. And 2,000 years ago, the Galilean taught that the two great commandments of human life are centered on the giving of love. You shall love the Lord your God, he taught, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself the value of inspiring philosophical and spiritual beliefs and practices is no longer mere hypothesis. It is proven fact. One careful national survey conducted by psychologists and sociologists even showed overwhelmingly that religious women had better sex lives than non-religious women. Subsequent polls and studies have reconfirmed the original report. The American Medical Association has released studies revealing that people who regularly attended religious worship services have lower blood pressure and fewer heart problems than the rest of the population as a whole. Psychological studies published in the respected Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion by Professor Raymond G. Carey show that using accepted mood and attitude measurement scales, men and women who engage in the daily practices of prayer or worship are measurably, statistically, happier and more cheerful in their average moods and attitudes than those who do not pray or worship. The fascinating fact is that doctors are finding a positive psychological attitude and a positive philosophy and religion are remarkably interlinked. The Swiss psychiatrist Dr. Carl Jung stated that he had never known of a patient over the age of 35 to recover from a deep psychological emotional problem without the help of and the development of a religious philosophy of life. It is this spiritual empowerment derived from the transcendent universe of meanings and values that energizes the most vibrant and alive personalities. Some may be concerned that They cannot comprehend intellectually all the ideas of the great philosophies and religions. This is not surprising. Should we expect to be able to scoop up the oceanic realities of the universe in a small tin cup of human reason? Arthur Balfour said a religion that is small enough for our understanding would not be large enough for our needs. Yet even that which we may not understand may be experienced. Who can explain love? Yet the person who has experienced it knows the reality of it, whether he can define it or not. And so with ultimate truth. The philosopher Schopenhauer wrote, Truth that has merely been learned is like an artificial limb, a false tooth, a waxen nose. It adheres to us only because it is put on. But truth acquired by thought of our own is like a natural limb. It alone truly belongs to us. One eminent psychiatrist, Dr. James T. Fisher, wrote in his work, The Casebook of a Psychiatrist, that if everything modern psychiatry had learned about healthy psychological attitudes were to be summarized and abbreviated, it would be nothing but an awkward and incomplete version of Jesus of Nazareth's Sermon on the Mount. At MIT, a series of studies have shown that a person who does not like himself or herself will be less tolerant and loving of other people. 
and conversely, the individual who values and respects himself can all the better value and respect others. Because in order to love your neighbor as yourself, the logical precondition is that one must, in the healthiest sense, love oneself. There must be normal self-respect and a sense of one's own spiritual self-value. The psychologist Dr. Eric Fromm has said the most important experience in life is love, and that the finest part of love is friendship. Dr. Sigmund Freud, as a result of his clinical studies, described the two essential aspects of psychological health to be Leben and Arbeiten, love and work. There must be outgoing affection, as well as the enjoyment of the tasks of life. Psychologist Bernard S. Robbins studied those individuals who say they detest working and found that such feelings nearly always are symptoms of serious neurosis. The psychologically normal individual, Dr. Robbins found, should derive three positive feelings from work. One, a feeling of usefulness. Two, self-confidence. And three, satisfaction. Therefore, in summation, the lifestyle of any individual will be tremendously strengthened by the inclusion of of vital philosophic and spiritual practices. Anyone can bend a plain iron rod, but if that iron be melted down and only 2% carbon stirred in, the result would be steel, both stronger and tremendously tougher than plain iron. Only 2% will make that difference. In every 24-hour day, there are exactly 1,440 minutes, and 2% of that is about 29 minutes. Any individual who will take as little as 2% of his or her day for higher philosophic thought and spiritual practices for prayer, meditation, and worship will become a personality of power and purpose astonishingly greater than before. Just as 2% of carbon makes the difference between soft iron and strong steel, 29 minutes a day for the philosophic and spiritual life can be the factor which transmutes a merely adequate person into a more far-sighted, decisive, vigorous, and joyful focal point of power and of progress. It does require initial efforts to change your habit patterns and learn the sorts of practices and priorities which I have been teaching. But as Alfred P. Sloan once put it, when you're through changing, you're through. And there is a great exhilaration in the processes of personal growth for endless spiritual growth is the eternal adventure of eternal life, beginning here and now for those who will claim it by faith. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviate it, SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>